I have never seen the top military brass in the country so directly contradict the commander in chief. It was an extraordinary moment. And, and I think it, it confirmed the perceptions that were coming out in real time, that there was different advice that was coming into the White House than that President Biden was willing to talk about because he was standing behind that decision, even as the situation crumbled, even as those service members were killed, even as it became clear that there were serious intelligence failures along the way. And I think this episode has had a more lasting impact than just foreign policy or just Afghanistan. You can look at President Biden's approval ratings on a range of issues issues, and they flipped almost mirror image around that moment, around the Afghanistan, that botched withdrawal. Because it, it involves so much and it involves the way we look globally, though no one can deny it was a disaster. No one can deny we left people behind. No one can deny what we saw with people hanging off wheel wells and, and we saw the chaos and the babies being handed over walls. You don't wait for Joe Biden to define it in a different way. Tom Cotton's here. Uh, he knows about this. He feels it. He's, an infant, he's in the infantry himself. He's now with Intelligence, Armed Services, and Judiciary Committees, former U.S. Army Infantry officer who's Ivy League grad. Senator, welcome back. First time in studio. But I want you to hear that because that's Jonathan Carl, not really an attack dog on Joe Biden, with, uh, with Rick Klein, who's an ABC kind of uh, a relatively fair guy. But I think it's totally underplayed. Every one of those commanders, you were asking questions. They said that they did not recommend this way to get out of that country. Yeah, Brian. Well, first off, thanks for having me on. It's great to be in the studio for the I first know, time. Finally. Great to be back in studio after two years uh, of working remotely. Um, so I, at the hearings last week, and it, it wasn't just General McKenzie and General Milley, but of Secretary Austin as well, who said that uh, President Biden rejected his advice. In addition to uh, General Scott Miller, who was the on-the-ground commander in Afghanistan, a legend in the special forces community, former commander of uh, Delta Force, spent almost eight years in Afghanistan over the last 20. All and when, for, and all when for, they made it clear that they were getting out this way, is that the reason he left? Uh, they took him out in mid-July, uh, and that was just part of their the military's phase plan okay. to move out. And, and I think part of the reason he left is they were uh, also had just given back Bagram. So what's a four-star commander going to do when you only have 600 troops left on the ground? But the reason why they, they did that is because when Joe Biden said you have to get out by September 11th, they have to start staging the withdrawal, and Biden didn't want to have any more troops go into Afghanistan to do something like hold Bagram. Now, of course, in the end, we ended up putting three times as many troops on the ground in August. In about a week. In about a week, as we had when Joe Biden made the decision to get out. Um, but the all those generals and the Secretary of Defense made it clear that the president rejected their advice to keep a small force in Afghanistan to keep the situation stabilized. They also made it clear, in my opinion, that they would have left troops past the August 31st deadline. If you go back and look at my questioning of General Milley, I said, you know, Joe Biden has been proclaiming how the Joint Chiefs unanimously agreed to get out of Afghanistan by August 31st, even though it meant we we're going to leave people behind. When did you make that recommendation? And he said, August 25th. I said, really, not August 15th? Not the day Kabul fell. He said, we were asked on August 25th. Would have gotten a different answer from the military if you had given them two weeks, not five days. And then third, in the second round of questioning, Gen or Secretary Austin acknowledged that neither he nor anyone in the Pentagon chose September 11th as a date by which to withdraw. They wouldn't say who did it, but obviously it came from the president or some political hack in the White House thinking it was somehow symbolic. It's a weird kind of symbolism, if you ask me. But it's, it's worse than just being a a useless political symbol. It was actually tactically dangerous because to get out by September 11th meant that you were withdrawing at the height of the summer fighting season. Even if you had just waited six months, if you were hell-bent on getting out, wait six months until the end of the year whenever it's winter in Afghanistan and the Taliban have largely gone back into their caves or gone back to Pakistan. So on multiple fronts, uh, our senior military leadership, you know, they didn't call Joe Biden a liar, but they articulated the facts that exposed his lies. Uh, I was fascinated to see other networks besides Fox ask Jen Psaki, three straight separate reporters, can you name the generals that did? Can you name the generals that did recommend this? I can't. That's a, I can't do that. Here's what Marsha Blackburn said about who might have recommended this to Joe Biden, although we think that's his idea anyway. Cut 39. I think the advice came from Ron Klein and Jake Sullivan and Susan Rice and Wendy Sherman and Anthony Blinken, mm. that they were saying, let's get out of there. Let's take this victory lap. Joe Biden, you can okay. say you're the guy that ended this. I think that's where it's coming from. What do you think about that? I mean, they're non-military people. 
So, so I, I think it's all political people in the White House, but I think it starts with Joe Biden. Remember, Joe Biden has taken pride for 12 years that he advised Barack Obama not to surge troop in, troops in Afghanistan in 2009. He would tell anyone who would listen, oh, the president, President Obama got rolled, he got boxed in by the military. That would never happen to me. In fact, back in April when he announced that we were withdrawing from um, Afghanistan, he was proud of that decision. He was all chesty about how he didn't let the military roll, roll him, how he stood up to him in a way that Trump and Obama wouldn't. Then four months later, once everything was uh, had gone to hell in a handbasket, all of a sudden it was like, well, this is what the generals told me. I just took their advice. No one told me that this could be a problem. So over the span of four months, he went from, from being proud and boasting that he had rejected the senior military leadership's advice to saying that he just followed it or they didn't give that advice to him. So what I don't understand, too, from your hearing is you asked General Milley, why didn't you not resign, right? And he said, well, you know, my dad didn't have, or my grandfather didn't have a, ch didn't have, or I guess his dad didn't have an opportunity to resign out in I Iwo Jima. I don't understand that analogy because you go into battle, does it, it, is Iwo Jima a mistake? Clearly, he must have known this is a mistake. You're, you're a military guy. When is it the right time to resign? Just because you're commander-in-chief and you disagree doesn't mean you should hand in your stars. So I, I understand the points he was making, and, and they're valid points for a senior uniformed officer to consider um, that we want our senior military leadership to give their best professional advice, to be candid about it, to caution the president when he's making a mistake. But in the end, it's the commander in chief that's elected to make these decisions. And second, that um, when a when a uniformed officer resigns, that can be an inherently political act uh, of making it clear that you disagree on a policy grounds. That's different from, say, a secretary of defense. Secretary of defense is still a political appointee. Um, I think the point about his father in Iwo Jima or those 13 troops at Abbey Gate is um, if if the president rejects the general's advice, the general's got a pretty easy path to resign. You can, you know, he's sitting comfortably in the E-ring of the Pentagon and up at Fort Myer, um, but those young sergeants, those young privates don't get a chance to do that and that it's incumbent upon senior military officers right. to keep them in mind. I think that's right. what he was getting at. And Senator, this I is, I want to play that out. Because if it comes out that General Milley will be resigning because he cannot go – no longer go along with this Afghanistan policy, maybe there is not a problem at Abbey Gate because he'll realize politically, Joe Biden, this is a disaster. If Mark Milley, who just stood up to Trump, is now resigning, this must be a terrible move. So maybe there may be a whole cobble. You know, it's, it's, poss it's possible that that could be a circumstance that any president could face. I just think because this president – Takes, has taken such a point of pride for 12 years that he's the one that will stand up to the military, that he won't get boxed in. He's too experienced and seasoned and wily. Um, I, I think that President Biden might have liked that. I bet Ron Klain would have liked it um, if any of his senior military leadership dissented publicly and resigned because it would, it would have fed into the narrative that they were spinning right. from April until the 1st of August, which is – Joe Biden is the tough, seasoned, experienced president who won't let these generals box him in. So I want to, when we get back, talk about something not, again, not getting a lot of traction, but I know you've been following. And that is what's happening with this storm investigation. Because a lot more than people think. But before I go, you have a vice president. I don't care about bad or good. I'm talking about disengaged. She went to California, told the press to stay alone, went speed walking with her husband while She's in charge of the border. We know that the Panamanian foreign minister said, I've been trying to get a hold of this administration to tell him about this problem since since January. And then you have the problem at the border. you got this issue in Afghanistan. you got this negotiation that's happening. She could be invaluable like Mike Pence was for Donald Trump because she has the relationships in the Senate. And you would imagine in the House. What is – can you just – can you – can you get your head around this? <laughs> I think the Biden high command maybe thought she'd do less damage if they sent her off to California for a weekend than if she was still in Washington. You think so? I mean, are they I, that – are you hearing – are they that separate because of her comments about Israel and at George Mason University? Well, I mean – And just, the genocide question that she threw in the street? Well, look, I mean, K Kamala Harris has not distinguished herself with a string of successes through her political life. She's kind of stumbled – upward from one job to the next, and you just see some of the things she's done as vice president, like sitting there nod, nodding idly when someone accuses Israel of committing genocide 
or responding to some reporter who asked why she hasn't been to the border by saying she hasn't been to Europe yet either. I mean, right. there's a reason why her presidential campaign imploded on the, on the launch pad and didn't even make it to the Iowa caucus. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.